Hello, my friends. Denise Fleck, the Pet Safety Crusader here. And today I'm going to chat with you about our smallest of furriest friends. And anybody that, you know, keeps some of these smaller critters in their heart and in their home or care gives for them as a professional pet sitter knows that rabbits are not small dogs or cats. And taking that a step further, they also know that guinea pigs, hamsters, gerbils, rats, and mice are not small rabbits. Each species is unique, and the way we care for them and also help them through a crisis can be different as well. So I just feel it's so important we learn about the individual species in our care in addition to learning about the unique and individual animal, because we all know, just like us, they have their own little personalities and messages and ways of communicating with us. So that's why I'm here to tell you today that I have just created Pet First Aid Basics for Rabbits and Pocket Pets. It's only a 90 minute long course and it is basic. Um, those of you that are aficionados on these species may wanna delve deeper. But I think so often we have these pets in our lives, um, whether they're you know, our personal best pals or if we're caring for them for somebody else. And you know, even teachers sometimes have some of these pets in a classroom situation. So I think it's really important that we understand some of the differences between them and know what to do when the worst does happen because just like with dogs and cats, you can't keep a rabbit or a guinea pig in a plastic bubble. Life is gonna happen and we need to be prepared to react when it does. For instance, did you know that rabbits really can't tolerate um, the temperature, the external temperature, when it gets above 80 degrees Fahrenheit? We really need to be concerned about them making sure they're in the AC, have a mister on, or just aren't being subjected to those temperatures. Did you also know that our rabbits are a completely different species from our guinea pigs, hamsters, gerbils, rats, and mice? Rabbits are actually called lagomorphs. And there's two other animals that fall in that um, category or genus. It would be hares, which are, you know, um, they aren't wild rabbits, it's a, it's a whole nother thing, which I explain in the webinar, and pika. Um, the reason rabbits are different from guinea pigs, gerbils, hamsters, there are several reasons, but one is that they have a second set of incisors. If you look in the mouth, they have um, another set of peg teeth right behind the first set of incisors. The other thing that makes them lagomorphs as opposed to rodents, which is what guinea pigs, hamsters, gerbils, mice and rats are you know, classified as, is, I hope nobody's eating lunch right about now, but rabbits have two types of poop. Um, one is often referred to as night poop because that's when it often takes place, but it can happen during the day as well. And it's a bit greasier. It's kind of like tiny little clumps that stick together. I hope I'm not deterring anybody from ever eating blackberries again, but it kind of looks like that, you know, all the little pieces stick together. And they still, that poop still has good nutrients in it. So the rabbits actually re-ingest it. So the second kind of poop that they re-ingest plus the um, second pair of incisors puts rabbits in a lagomorph category as opposed to the um, rodent category of our guinea pigs, gerbils, hamsters, mice, and rats. So I guess you never thought you'd be turning it, tuning in today to learn about poop that is ingested, but it's a very natural thing for rabbits because that night poop, that second type of greasy poop, really does have good nutrients. So it's obviously something important you need to know if you care for a rabbit. Um, some other things like, do you know what a binky is? B-I-N-K-Y. Some of you that are moms and grandmas um, might think of it as um, something else that actually goes in a child's mouth, like a pacifier. Sometimes they refer to that as a binky. But a binky is actually just a joyful expression a rabbit does, a yippee or a yay, where actually all four paws come off the ground. Because rabbits don't normally hop like a frog. They don't come you know, with all four um, paws off the ground at the same time, particularly because the, of the difference in the length of the front legs from the hind legs, rabbits often zigzag. 
Um, so their hop is very different. And I'm just hoping some of these things I'm sharing with you is like putting the light bulb on in your head saying, oh yeah, I've recognized that before in a rabbit, or gosh, I guess I need to tune in a little bit better, and maybe I need to take that first aid basic so I can learn more about the care and also how to help the rabbit friends in my life. Um, few other things of importance to note is that rabbits cannot throw up. So they're often, I don't want to say often, but one of the, the more common ailments rabbits are inflicted with is called GI stasis, gastrointestinal stasis. And those of you that may have equine or canine friends in your life may know of something similar. Um, in the different species, it's brought about often by different causes, and the treatment may be um, somewhat dissimilar, actually, but uh, the, the idea of what's happening in the animal's body is the same. And in rabbits, it's called GI stasis. In dogs, it's called bloat. And in horses, it's called colic. So there are, you know, don't quote me verbatim here, there are some differences in this. But um, it's a really important thing to know about with your, your bunny um, to make sure it doesn't happen. Because unlike dogs, cats, and humans, rabbits have a completely different digestive system. And things have to keep moving all the time. That's why fiber is just such an important part of their diet. They have to have that fiber to keep things moving because if things stop, if the rabbit doesn't eat for 24 hours or if he, doesn't, he or she doesn't poop in 12 hours, we're in a serious situation. So that is, you know, some of the reasons I put together this course for you where you can learn first aid basics for rabbits and pocket pets. I hope it'll be really helpful for pet parents, for teachers, for professional pet sitters. Um, it comes together with a lot of experience. I've had volunteering at shelters and species specific shelters and, you know, talking to people that are pet parents, rabbit parents, guinea pig parents, and hopefully it's just gonna give you the basics and make you feel that much more confident should your tiniest furry creature get into trouble. But there are some times that regardless of the first aid, you absolutely have to get your bunny to the um, veterinarian. And remember again, in the cases of, case of rabbits, guinea pigs, hamsters, gerbils, and so on, um, you're gonna have to have a species specific veterinarian. Some, in some cities, some practices, the veterinarian that helps your dog or cat may be able to help your rabbit or pocket pet, but some are much more specialized. So you need to find that out ahead of time and make sure you have your species specific veterinarian on speed dial should you need that person. Um, but like I mentioned, if a rabbit doesn't eat in 24 hours or hasn't pooped in 12 hours, you need to get him to the vet. He could be in GI stasis. If they're lethargic or unresponsive, if their body temperature drops below 99 or goes above 104. Um, and one way you want to prevent that, of course, it could always be caused um, due to a trauma, a fever, or an infection. But we certainly want to make sure we're keeping them cool in these warmer summer months. Remember, I once again said your red flag is if it's 80 degrees Fahrenheit in the room or outside, that's starting to get too warm for your rabbit. And they don't um, have sweat glands even in their paws like our dogs and cats. Most of their sweat glands are actually in their lips and they'll sometimes rotate their ears um, to try to open up the blood vessels there to cool themselves off. But they really are a different species. So I can't reiterate enough that rabbits are not small dogs or cats and that guinea pigs, hamsters and so on are not small rabbits. They all have their um, own different biology, personality, and food and care needs. Um, something that sometimes happens with a rabbit is a head tilt, or um, you know, certainly he could be holding or dangling a limb. They're, these precious little friends, when we let them roam about our house, sometimes they can get stepped on, they can climb underneath a pillow and we plop down on the sofa. Um, they could, you know, something could fall on them as they're going off in a corner. So just like when you have a dog or a cat, you have a furry child for the life of that pet. And they're not by no means a, a short commitment. Um, depending on the rodent, it's possible they may only live to one to three years on average. I mean, you know, there's always the super ones that, you know, we get to have more time with. So I often suggest, especially when I was teaching high school animal care, that that was the kind of pet maybe when you were going off to college because um, 
when you're in college, obviously, in most cases, there are some, and I have had some great students that have actually gone on to college and had therapy dogs and, um, you know, but then they can take them to classrooms and whatnot. But just having a, a personal pet of a dog or a cat can be more difficult during your college years. But something along the lines of a, a road might be acceptable as long as your all of your roommates are on board because they do unfortunately have an even shorter lifespan than our dogs and cats. And by the time you're out of college, life is going to be changing and an upheaval again. So, um, you know, it's hard to sometimes make a transition with a pet that, you know, will be with you much longer. Rabbits can live 10 to 12 years. So um, they are a longer term commitment, almost, you know, like a, a dog in many cases or even a cat. So um, don't think, you know, you're going to have them for a little time because just like with our dogs and cats, if you adopt a rabbit, a guinea pig, a hamster or any of these furry little critters, it's a commitment for the lifetime of that animal and you want to be there for them. So again, I'm here today to introduce you to my new online webinar. It's what it is, is it's a 90 minute self-guided journey for you. I've recorded it. You get to hear my voice for 90 minutes, but of course you can hit pause and you can go back and rewind and listen to me later. So you don't have to listen to me for 90 minutes straight, but I'm trying to give you um, some of the tips on caring for these tiniest furry creatures and what you need to do when, you know, something isn't quite right with them. Um, just like with dogs and cats, first aid may not be the final stop along the route, but it's what you can do to make them more comfortable and prevent further injury before you can get them to competent veterinary medical care. Um, putting together this webinar has actually inspired me. I wasn't going to do this because in the back of my disaster preparedness book, I have a short section on first aid for rabbits and pocket pets. But I think I'm going to have to put together a small little handbook. It won't be super long, maybe just 20, 25 pages. But um, I'm going to put something together soon so that you have um, something to look at in front of you in addition to the webinar so you can always go back and refer to it. So that's my story for today. But you know what? I'm going to put a call out since I'm thinking about doing this now. And if any of you have really good, clear pictures of rabbits or guinea pigs or gerbils or hamsters or mice or rats, um, those are basically the ones I'm covering in this book. And do you know that like gerbils aren't um, legal to have everywhere? In California and Hawaii in particular, you can't own a gerbil um, simply because if they get loose, Two gerbils equals 100 very quickly, and they cause problems to the indigenous plant life and animal life there. So you, you need to know all of this stuff if you're going to care for these critters. But I am putting a call out, and if any of you have awesome pictures, um, close-ups of the rabbits or the pocket pets, um, actually ho properly holding them. I won't say you have to do first aid, but just a few pictures that I could possibly add to this. Please Please send them to PetSafetyCrusader at gmail.com, and if I use them, I'll be sure to um, make sure you get a copy of the booklet when it's ready. But thank you again for tuning in. Um, I'm not done yet in that there will be a bird first aid webinar available probably next week as soon as I finish recording it, because it just seems so many of you have all kinds of creatures in your lives, and it's just so important that we really know how to cherish and care for all of these species. Um, I'm just putting good wishes out there after the fireworks last night and the night before and the days that followed that all of the pets that were frightened and all the wildlife finds its way to safety. And I hope you had an awesome Independence Day and we'll have an even more awesome, awesome rest of the week. So thanks for tuning in again. I saw Anna and I saw Barbara and I saw Cheryl and a whole bunch more of you there. So thank you for tuning in and love those little critters just like you love the bigger ones. Bye-bye for now.